Okay, the recording is on. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for connecting to BC309, our class on urban church planting. And today is uh, the second lecture this week on urban church planting. We're going to pick up from uh, where we paused yesterday and uh, go forward. All right, let's take a mo moment just to pray together. Before we get started, can I request somebody to pray? Uh, is my audio okay? Can you all hear me all right? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Stop. Somebody can pray and then they will start. Anybody can lead us in prayer? Our Father and our God, we want to thank you. We want to bless your name. We want to give you thanks for another opportunity, another privilege to be here and to study your word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will open our ears and open our minds to hear the word of God and open our hearts to receive the word of God. Commit every soul and everyone that is in this place. And we ask, Lord, that you will teach us what we need to know that your name alone will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Harrison. And uh, once again, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, we, we've been talking about urban church planting and uh, just looking at different aspects of this whole process. We are currently uh, in, in that stage where we've been talking about strategy for urban evangelism or urban mission. You know, what are some things we can do and what are some ways in which we can uh, reach out, evangelize, uh, engage in mission when we are planting um, uh, a church. And of course, this isn't, it's not restricted only to a church, but even if you're doing some other kind of ministry, you want to you know, reach out to people, and what are some ways we can do that? So we um, talked about several different ways, you know, and then we moved into talking about the seven mountain assignments. Now, when I uh, when I am uh, uh, explaining or, or sharing with you about the seven mountain assignment, uh, I do want to make it clear that. Uh, we're basically talking about fulfilling the Great Commission, but in a in a strategic way, in by affecting the seven spheres of society, the separate the seven different spheres of society, by very strategically affecting that, by mobilizing God's people to affect that, so that we can the gospel gospel can be brought in, and then people can be uh, saved and discipled. Um, what I do want to um, say is that, you know, as, as the question was asked last class, um, there is, you know, there is a, a, what to say, an aberration or a pushing of this idea beyond its intended uh, expression where, uh, you know, you, you might hear people say, you know, the church has to take over every part of society and uh, it has to be on, you know, it has to be controlling every sphere and all of that. So uh, uh, that's an aberration, meaning it's, it's not what Jesus commanded us to do. He told us to go make disciples of all nations. That's our present calling or our commission, which is to uh, go and disciple people um, about, you know, when the Lord comes uh, in the millennium, and we're talking about Revelation chapter 20, uh, when he comes and he sets up his kingdom here on earth, when we, when he's, when, when Jesus is carrying out his thousand year reign on, on the earth, that's a different thing where, uh, he will, you know, he will establish his kingdom. And so that's a literal expression of his kingdom. Right now we're talking about discipling these spheres of society and how do we do that? So that's the focus, and that's where we want to stay. We don't want to kind of go off on a tangent outside of uh, what it was originally intended. 
So uh, just quickly review, and we will complete this particular uh, lesson on uh, the seven mountains. This is lesson number 13. Just quick review. Uh, we said that there are the seven spheres or seven pillars or the seven main areas uh, of society. If you want to look at it in a very broad way, uh, we can talk about the family, religion, education, media, arts and entertainment, business and government, seven areas. And so what we're saying is the people of God, God, God's people, believers, us people, we need to be involved in all of these seven areas so that we can transform culture. So the first step is transform culture. That means we challenge um, the norm, so the, the way people are thinking. Uh, we challenge culture or we transform culture so that the hearts of the people can be prepared to receive the gospel. But then when the gospel is brought to them, some of them will believe, be saved, and they can be discipled. So, so our goal here is, you know, how do believers, how can believers transform culture in these seven spheres, the seven areas? We said, you know, one way we, and I'm just quickly reviewing, one way we model the biblical principle, we live it out there and before them, uh, we let our light shine with our, the work that we do, uh, what we do. And of course, there is the spiritual side of it. That means we engage with prayer and uh, intercession and the bringing of the gospel and so on. But in order for that to happen, we have to prepare the church, prepare believers. So what are the three areas to prepare believers in? We said uh, heart preparation. So we have to be strong inside. We have to be able to guard our desires, guard our motivations, and guard our character. We also said there's spiritual preparations. That means believers need to know, okay, what are the principles, biblical principles that I'm supposed to be applying in uh, my sphere, you know, whichever area they're involved in. So they need to be taught that. We need to see it in the Bible. We need to see it in God's word. And also we need to encourage believers to tap into spiritual resources. That means... Uh, don't try to do this all by yourself. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. Uh, depend on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Depend on faith in God and so on. You know, so depend on God, really. And of course, there is the natural preparation, which is each person has to be good in their work. Uh, they have to continuously learn, develop their skills, capabilities, whichever area they are engaged in. So that's how we, we encourage believers to prepare. So last part of this whole a lesson here is positioning. You know, um, the traditional mindset in the church is to come out, come away. You see, the Bible tells us, it's very interesting, if you look at the paradoxes in scripture, that means, when we say paradox, it means they are like two opposite statements but both statements are true. So for example, on the one hand, God said, come out and be separate. Now this is 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I think it's verse 18 or something. It's God says, come out and be separate. And the, the meaning of the word church is ecclesia, a people who have been called out to assemble together. They are called out people. And yet, on the other hand, God also says, and I'm quoting what Jesus said in Luke 19.13, he says, occupy till I come. So one hand he says, come out. Another hand he says, stay there. Now it's almost like opposite, contradictory. He says, come out, but stay there. Occupy. Both are correct. Both are truth. And they have an application. They have a context. So come out, meaning don't engage with the evil, the sin, um, the wickedness. Occupy. Be there. That means you need to be there in and amongst the people so that we can be salt and light and have influence. So both are true. Both are, have a context. So traditionally, 
you know, the church has emphasized, come out, be separate. But we also need to encourage people, occupy, be in there, be amongst the people so that we can be salt and light. So occupy, that means take up your place and be where God wants you to be and position yourself there so that you can uh, make a difference. Now, when we're talking about occupy or taking your place, um, there can be so many positions, you know, some people, uh, so many different roles that people can play in these seven spheres. Not everybody is going to become a CEO. Not everybody is going to become the owner of a business. Not everybody is going to be, you know, like the prime minister or the president. No. There are, there are going to be so many different places uh, that, that need to be uh, filled or, or positions to be held where we can have influence. And so uh, that's another important thing to let people know. And, you know, not everybody is going to be at the top. And we need people at all levels. So there may be people that God raises up to be transformers, like uh, leaders, like Joseph and Daniel. Uh, there may be people who are just influencers. They um, are. They may not be the leaders, but they are in a place of influence. You know, think about Esther. Uh, she came into a place where she could influence the king. Uh, think about Naaman's maid. Uh, she was in that place where she could influence the. Syrian general. Um, so we could have people who are influencers. They may be quiet there, but they can have influence on others. Uh, people, there could be people who have access, like Nehemiah. He was a cupbearer, but he had access to the king. And because of God's favor on his life, he had access to many resources. You know, when Nehemiah told the king, I want to go and I want to, you know, I'm on my, it's in my heart to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. The king said, go, I'll give you, you can go, take leave. I will send you an escort. I'll send people to take you there. Uh, uh, whatever you need, I will can make it available. So God positioned Nehemiah as an accessor. He was able to bring these resources in to, uh, uh, to, to carry out the purpose of God. So like that, God may position people who give, who you know have access and they are able to bring in provision for the work of God's kingdom. Uh, there may be people who are, you know, I, I'm just ma I, I just made up these terms. They're, they're, they're not anything technical, but you know, there are people who may be on more than one mountain, like uh, Moses or Paul. You know, they, 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 they touch people in different spheres. Uh, so Paul was a preacher, but he was able to touch people in authority. He was able to speak to the religious people. He was also able to speak to you know ordinary people outside in the marketplace. So he was you know he moved in different spheres, touching people uh, in different spheres. Moses himself in the Old Testament, yeah, of course he was a, a, a great leader, but he was able to stand before Pharaoh. He was able to uh, lead his people. Uh, he also mobilized his people to go into battle uh, under the leadership of Joshua. So uh, uh, he influenced the priests. He brought in the, the law, the priesthood, so on. So he stood in many different roles and he, he, he worked across various uh, areas. So God may use his people in different ways. Some people can be trendsetters. They could be, you know, on the cutting edge. They could be innovative, creative, coming up with new ideas, and uh, where others begin to follow the trends they set. Some people could be catalysts. They can, you know, uh, cause things to happen. Uh, and uh, while they themselves may not necessarily be the main leaders, they are the people who stir things up. Um, they cause things, cause change to happen. So, you know, the point is, as we equip and mobilize God's people, we encourage them, you know, take whatever position, wherever God places you. You know, it could be at the grassroots level, it could be at the mid-level, it could be at the senior level, or it could be at the top level, wherever God places. Take your place, 
occupy, be there. And in that place where God puts you, begin to transform culture. Begin to demonstrate the principles of the kingdom. Uh, let your works point people to God. And of course, have spiritual influence, which is you pray, how you intercede, and you bring in the gospel to those areas so that then they can begin to influence. Now, just try to imagine if we are able to do this. You know, how, how beautiful it will be. And our people, when I say our people, meaning believers, can begin to touch people outside at all levels in all of these seven spheres. Right? So, but, but I think it all begins with a change in mindset by telling people, you can be there, occupy. You know, others, people are always hearing, come out, come out, come out, be separate, come out, be separate, come out, be separate. But how about we tell them, take your place. You know, in media, take your place. In arts and entertainment, take your place. In government, if God wants you there, take your place. In education, if God wants you there, wherever, wherever God wants you, take your place and begin to make a difference, right? So that's this whole part about the seven mountains and how we can intentionally move people in those areas. Now, remember, all this takes time. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be done in a week. But we constantly keep giving input to the believers so that they can begin to make a difference wherever God has placed them. Okay? So... Before we go into the next chapter or next lesson, let me pause. Any questions, any thoughts are on the seven mountains? Uh, is it, was it clear? Did, did we all understand it? Uh, is it clear what our intent is and what our objectives are? Any questions? Christopher, go ahead. Uh, yes, Pastor. I, I just, uh, something that I uh, think would, you know, an observation basically where in each of the seven mountains um, where the uh, the leadership team is of a certain, uh, you know, religion. Um, and so, for example, a government um, you know, where it is predominantly uh, of a certain religion, so you know, maybe a, a Christian state, for example, um, it, it uh, definitely helps. I think um, you know to facilitate um, this uh, spread of uh, uh, religion and its you know, you know its, and the tenets of uh, religion in that particular mountain. Mm. So I, I mean, just an observation. I I just think that uh, uh, you know. I, that it definitely helps, and uh, just want, maybe you could could shed some light on that also, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, being at the top, um, we definitely have a lot of influence, but then we also have to be very careful. You know, um, for example, if a believer as a chief minister, and, and this I say about government, if a believer as a chief minister or the prime minister, head of a state or head of government. Now, uh, definitely uh, he has great influence, he or she will have great influence. But the challenge is uh, they also have to serve all of the people. Yeah, they can't just serve, um, or they, they can't give preferential treatment uh, to people of a particular religion. They should not. I'm talking especially about a democratic government. Uh, of course, it, it, it is different in a, in a, in a um, religious state. You know, if, uh, if there is a state religion, then that, that's a different situation. But in, 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 in a democratic setting, the leader, you know, um, he definitely will have influence and he definitely will be able to 
in, uh, you know, to show that, look, I, I, I am an example. Let's say if it's a Christian. I am a Christian, wonderful. But uh, he is also, he's an elected leader, which means he has to represent all communities, all religions fairly and equally. So it's a very challenging, actually, it's a very challenging situation. Now, uh, for me, I have uh, I had the privilege of you know just knowing one uh, leader who was the chief minister, and uh, you know had the opportunity of going spending time with him. And these are one of the one of the questions that we discussed, which is okay. He's a chief minister. And he's a believer, but in our country, majority are non-Christians, you know, and they have elected him, basically. It's not you know, because the Christian population is very small. We can't say the Christians elected him. No, he's the chief minister, but the majority who elected him are non-Christians, and he's the chief minister. And he has to represent her. And so, for example, here's the challenge. He's a believer, but the Hindus will invite him to inaugurate maybe a temple. The Muslims will invite him to inaugurate, uh, you know, some, or just to come to uh, some of their functions. Now, he's a believer. People know he's a Christian. But when he is serving as in that government, Capacity. He has to treat everybody equally. He has to go for, you know, uh, uh, these 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 functions that are from by the Hindus. He has to go for the Muslims. He has to go for the Christians. He can't just say, "I'll only go for the Christians." Christians are very minor, are a minority. So it's a big challenge. Now the sad thing is the Christians will accuse him. So hey, you're a Christian. Why are you going for the Muslim? No, he's going there not as a Christian. He's going there as the, an elected chief minister as a chief minister representing everybody in the state, you know. Uh, so we've had these conversations and, and, and I encouraged him. I said, see, you are representing everybody. You're not representing just the Christians. You gotta represent everybody. So you gotta treat everybody equally. You go, you show that you care for everybody equally. All the programs are available for everybody equally. So to answer your question, uh, yes. When, 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 when people are in places of authority or leadership at the top, um, there is great influence. But the challenges or the responsibilities are great, especially when you have to represent everybody. You know, so nobody becomes the CEO of a company because they're Christian. You know, they become the CEO of a company because they put in their work and uh, uh, they are going to uh, further the purpose of the organization. Uh, and they're going to represent everybody in the organization equally. And yet they have to be Christian in that. So that's, uh, I think uh, it's, it's a big challenge, something a, a lot of thought has to be given to it. Uh, and we have to be careful not to, you know, uh, do things that actually um, 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 uh, prevent people from being open to the gospel because they know we are Christian. In that place of leadership. So I hope I've uh, shared a few thoughts on that. Uh, if it's useful, I, I don't know if you have further questions, Christopher. Okay. Um, Abhi's question uh, Pastor, can you explain the last point again? Catalyst at any level, please, with example. Okay. Yeah. So catalyst simply means a change agent, right? So any at any level, if you are able to bring change, and that's a great thing. So example, uh, take for example, a school teacher. And I, a school teacher, a, a teacher, teacher uh, can be a catalyst, bring about a change. So a change for the, for the good, for the, for the benefit of people. So example, if, and, and, and especially in current scenarios, you know, uh, if uh, let's say a teacher is uh, uh, just for just for example, is in the nursery section, uh, or, or let's say in grades one to five, or just just for example, there's the, a the teacher there, and she observes that you know students in grades one to five have a certain need, 
to need, but nothing is being done to address that. And uh, everything is going in one direction, but a very important need is not being addressed. But what can this teacher do? Can be a catalyst. That means uh, the teacher can present to the people in authority saying that, hey, look, we need to change. We need to make some changes in order to address this need. And you know, you present it, you, and so what happens? You, you, you're a catalyst, you bring about a change, and a particular need is addressed. Yeah. And so, just one example. And then, through that, you know, we can point, you know, okay, how did you get this idea, or how, what did you do? That can give glory to God, it can call, point people to uh, our Heavenly Father because they see our good works and they will glorify our Father was in heaven. So catalyst is simply a change agent. It could be a simple thing as addressing, changing, you know, what is being done in order to address a need. And of course, there could be some more dramatic change that, that could take place. Is that okay? All right. Any other questions on, on the seven mountains and how we can mobilize the church to do that? Okay. So, um, you know, as, as uh, when we are pioneering a work in a city, we need to look for these opportunities and pray that God will give us opportunities. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, remember, the city is dynamic, meaning things are always changing, constantly changing in the city. So sometimes things that worked five years ago uh, or the approaches and the methods we took five years ago uh, may no longer be relevant today. And so what do we do? We have to change and say, okay, you know, God give us strategies. How are we going to affect this community? How are we going to affect that sphere of influence? Five years ago, we did it like this. But now things have changed. That whole sphere, uh, the dynamics in that sphere of that particular mountain has changed. So now we may have to rethink our strategy. We may have to come up with new ways of how to influence that uh, particular sphere, you know, whether it's media, arts, entertainment, education, so on. We can rethink that. And so we, we do it. You know, uh, I remember, I think uh, this is again, of course, before the pandemic, we, um, uh, we were able to a limited extent get access into a management school, management college, sorry here in our city and we were able to place uh, one of our books we have a book that's called timeless principles uh, we were able to place copies of that book for for the management students and we were even able to do some lectures in that college using some of these lessons some of our chapters uh, from that book so that was a an opportunity that we had you know, this is, you know, of course, all these college students are, you know, they, maybe 80% of them are not are from non-Christian backgrounds. And so it was a wonderful opportunity. And one of the reasons we were able to do it was because there was somebody in that college who was very, you know, well-connected with us. I mean, like, they, that person was, like, championing our cause in that college. But now things have changed. We don't have that opportunity. And of course, uh, you know, because of this two, two and a half year uh, period when a lot of things were closed, uh, everything died down. So now we have to rethink, you know, how do we, how can we, you know, gain entrance into various places in our city as things begin to open up? How can we go back there? How can we begin to influence? You know, uh, what are some things we can do? So for example, recently uh, we did a sermon series in church on uh, the four C's of leadership. Now, of course, it was for, the series was done for uh, people in our congregation, for people, believers. We talked about the four C's of leadership. But the response from quite a number of people was, hey, all of these things, that we are learning in church, 
are so useful for us in our professional work. And so how can we share this in our, you know, in our professional, in our companies, in our corporate work places? So one of them, one of the young people, uh, young man, he actually, so we did a little graphic. So he actually started sharing so that saying, hey, this is what I'm learning, you know, about, it's very simple, it's four, four C's about character, competence, compassion, and uh, charisma, very simple. Uh, and under that, we have seven attributes for each. So he started sharing this with his people in his company, you know, just to pique their interest and uh, let them know that, you know, it, it can be a connect back to the church. Now, this is, he is working in a corporate, IT corporate setting. So he's connecting back, con connecting them back to it. Then somebody else came up with the idea that, you know, if you, if we can uh, create uh, some small table uh, placeholder, so something that we just keep on our desks, uh, which says, you know, four C's of leadership has these four boxes and a link to the website where if they're interested, they can, they can just scan the QR code or something, just go to the website and they will get, you know, they can listen to the messages or what to take the sermon notes and so on. So they said, you know, if, if we can do this, we just keep it on our desk or wherever we are, you know, in, 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 the, in the workplace. And it becomes a conversation starter. So when somebody comes in and asks, hey, what is that? What are, what are the four C's of leadership? Uh, then they start a conversation. Oh, you know, this, this was something we were just, you know, learning about. It's very simple, but very powerful uh, on, you know, what makes good leaders. We were learning this in church. If you're interested, you know, just scan the code. you will go to the website. You'll get the resources. So it just becomes a conversation starter. So we're kind of working on that. Uh, you know, we're going to create those um, small placeholders, give it to people. And those, I mean, not everybody is back in the office, but those who are back in the office physically, you know, they could just keep it on the desk and just start a conversation. People ask me, what is it? Hey, we're learning about, lead we learned about leadership. There's four important things, so they're very simple, very powerful, and this becomes a conversation. So, uh, so again, so we are working on it and then we will mobilize our people. Okay, those who want to do it, do it. You know, we're not forcing everybody to do it. Uh, it's just an idea. Uh, those who are comfortable doing it, uh, just, you know, and it's very generic. It's not directly spiritual or directly religious. It's, we're talking about four C's of leadership. You know, that becomes a conversation starter. So, like that, you know, uh, uh, with ideas, that simple ideas. You know, we can begin to slowly go into all of these seven spheres, begin to empower and equip believers to begin to make a difference whichever field they are in, right? Uh, they can begin to make a difference. And then through that, we can uh, win souls and uh, disciple people, okay? Oh, all right, I see uh, Christopher, okay. Yeah, so Christopher, we're just getting a design, so I let the people who are handling the design work it out. Uh, I think what they're doing is, uh, 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 so Chris was mentioned, have four C's on one side and uh, other details. So it's just going to be just four C's for the four boxes, and then there's a QR code and also a URL, a short URL, where people can just go and look at it. And uh, I think it's double-sided. Uh, I'm not sure that the people are working doing the design. So uh, uh, I'm leaving it to them to figure that out. Yeah. But thanks for sharing, Christopher. Okay. Um, anything else? Any thoughts on this seven mountains before we move on? Okay. All right. So let's go to the um, next lesson. I'm just going to share the PDF. And um, part of um, what we do when you are pioneering a work, um, uh, pioneering a church, or pioneering a ministry is uh, to keep in mind that any work you start, whether it's a local church or church plant or a ministry, it's going to go through stages of growth. Right? And uh, this is something you have already seen um, 
in the course on the house of God. Uh, I've put it in here uh, more for completeness and just as a reminder that, um, you know, we must be very conscious about uh, stages of growth okay? and, 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 and understand where you are in this whole process of pioneering and developing a local church or a ministry in an urban context. And then you go from there. So, of course, in the first two, three years, um, you would, or we would be in the pioneering stage, right? So when you are starting your work, and that's basically the focus of this course, which is urban church planting. You're, you're, how do you plant something? Now, how do you start something? And what are the things you keep in mind? So the first two, three years are, are typically this pioneering stage where uh, you are getting your team together, you are establishing yourself in that particular city or territory or region, right, wherever God sent you. Um, there's a lot of groundwork that you're doing, you know, through your prayer intercession, uh, reaching out, reaching out to the community. And basically, your go goal is to lay a good foundation. Right? This is your pioneering stage is really your foundation stage. And you have to think like that. That means if you lay a good foundation, then you can build big and you can build strong. If the foundation is weak, is shaky, you can't, you can't do too much. Time may pass, but the foundation is weak. There's not much you can do. Uh, uh, or you can't build big or you can't build high and strong on a weak foundation okay so a pioneering stage important very important it's your foundation stage and some of the things i want to just mention here about the pioneering stage the foundation stage is to establish commitment that you must demonstrate commitment to the people and the place that God has called you to. It's not easy. Now, I understand that there are people who are, you know, uh, uh, who are, um, uh, who would keep moving from place to place. That means they'll go to a place for maybe six months, two years, whatever. Uh, they do something and they move on. Um, they, they try to start something very quickly in six months to two years, and they move on. Uh, not everybody can get things started and established in such a short time. So if you have the resources, then of course you would put a team together, and that team is going to continue to work. So therefore you have the luxury uh, or the, the opportunity to move on in six months to two years. You can move on if you're able to establish a good team. But otherwise, this is, becomes important. That means you are going to be committed to that city, that people, that place, to make sure that church becomes strong, which is going to take time. So that pioneering stage is very important to establish commitment, if you're going to be there for the long term. I understand, like I said already, uh, there are some people who do it differently, meaning they come in, they assemble the people, they empower the people, and they, they hand it off to the people and they move on. That's a different strategy, which we're not uh, looking at. What we are looking at is you are committed, you're called to raise up a work, a church, or a ministry. Therefore, you have to establish commitment. Right? So in establishing commitment, some of the things that we look at is you know, you stay focused on the vision. Don't give up on the vision. You've got to be willing to go. I believe you've given me a vision to do this, and I'm going to stay with it no matter what. That kind of a commitment we need to make. Right Now, if God has called you more into a kind of ministry where, you know, you kind of put a team together, get them started, and move on, okay, that's a different thing. Otherwise, 
this kind of commitment. Lord, I'm going to be here. Whatever it takes, I'm going to get this work done. You're committed to the people and you're committed to the place where God has sent you. Second important thing in the pioneering stage is that you are going to put things in place for the long term. You're not there to just look at short-term results, but you are putting things in place for the long term. You're always thinking. And one of the ways I, I want to encourage you to think is this. I want to be able, and, 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 and I want to be able, whether I have five people, 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people, I want to behave the same way. I want to conduct myself the same way. That I have five people, 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people, I will conduct myself the same way. So, with that in mind, how am I going to do my book? What are, what are the, some of the uh, principles or guidelines I must have in the way I work? So that whether it's five, fifty, five hundred, or five thousand, how I go about doing things basically remains the same. How can I do that? So now I, I, I want you to understand this in 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 yeah uh, correctly. Of course, when things are bigger, there's more responsibility and. You would change with that. I'm not, I'm not saying you won't. But for example, let, let me give this, give this as an example. For instance, in the very beginning, if you put it down as your way of working that, you know, if people want to meet me, they can come and meet me where I am, like maybe in my office. And only if it is an, uh, a very necessary thing, like somebody is in the hospital, uh, some situation like that, that they can't come, of course, and they need us, we will go and meet them. But if it is for general, you know, they want to talk, they want to get some guidance, they want to get some counsel, they want to get some input, then for conversations and all that, they come and meet me. And you keep that as the way you operate, whether you have five people, 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people. What will happen? People will see that you never changed. And they will respect that. Otherwise, for instance, if in the early days, you know, okay, we have five people, five people call me, and I go to five different places to meet them, yeah, okay, you can do that. And there are 50 people, ah, it's going to wear you out. How are you going to go to you know so many different places to meet them when you're 500? So then when you suddenly change and say, guys, I'm, I cannot come and see you. You please come and meet me. People are going to point a finger and say, oh, you know, he's changed his attitude or he thinks too highly of himself now, etc. But if from the very beginning you set down certain ways of working, it is going to remain consistent through time and even as you scale up, that people will see that, okay, he hasn't changed. It's the same thing, you know? When we were five people, it was the same thing. We all went and met him. When we were 50 people, same thing, we went and met him. When we were 500 people, same thing, we went and met him. 5,000 people, same thing, we went and met him. You know, it hasn't changed. Um, I'm just giving one example. So you have to think, think like that. You say, the way I work today, if I can remain consistent, even as things scale, I want to put things in place in such a way that even when things scale, I don't have to change. I'm still the same person. That's going to be very helpful. Let me pause here. Um, uh, uh, and you know, we will continue on this pioneering stage a little bit more next, next week. I'll share some more thoughts on it. Uh, yeah, Shri Kumar, you have a question? Yes, sir. Can I ask now or can I ask? Yeah, you can ask. We have a few minutes. Yeah, yeah thank you, sir. Uh, 
uh, sir, as you said right now, uh, to the way of working should not be changed. Uh, but um, I have seen uh, in different ministries, and uh, you know, so when I see, uh, and I found that as their church grows, uh, they are also not getting the time to visit um, many places, or you know, so they they actually um, stop meeting the people. Or they they just prefer that uh, you know they they just choose that where to go or where not to go. So, but as you said um, in the beginning, uh, like when it is five people or ten people, it was easy for them to handle. So now, but now as you said now that from the beginning itself, if we uh, follow a like I don't you set up a pattern of working. So how it how, how it can be how we can do that like you know from the beginning itself uh, do. Uh, like from the beginning itself, um, we can tell the people that um, no, it's not. We are not come. We will not come to your house, but you have to come to my place and you have to meet me. I just want to know that because as the church increases, the responsibility of a servant of God also increases. He needs more time in prayer and all. So that is my question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, um, I can share what we did. Uh, I'm not. I, I, I'm not saying that this is the best way or this is the right way. I can just share what we did, like uh, right from the beginning. Uh, that was our approach. That means uh, all our, uh, I, I did it myself, and I also to, told all of our entire pastoral team this is how we will work. That is, if people want to meet us, they just come and they come to our office. They come to where we are and meet with us. We are available, but they come to us for several reasons. Like, you know, basically, um, one is this is the way we're going to work right through. And also, it saves us our time. So we can actually meet more people, you know. So rather than spending our time in traveling, we can be in one place, then we can actually serve more people if they just come and they meet us. So uh, right from the beginning, from day one, that was the way we started when we were, you know, 10 people or hundred or whatever, it's the same thing. So people just make an appointment. They say, I'm, you know, we give them a day and time. They come and meet us. So, and uh, at least in our experience, uh, 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 all our people are understanding of that. There may be a few who insist that we come and then we have to tell them, no, you know, you please come and meet me and so on. Uh, but for general meetings, they come. Now, of course, if somebody is unwell, somebody's sick, uh, there's an emergency, uh, somebody has passed away, of course, all of these things we go, right? Uh, or somebody from our team will go uh, and, and meet the people. But in all other cases, so we, so to answer your question, we started doing that from the very beginning. And uh, uh, in our experience, uh, people have been very accommodating or very understanding. Uh, we've not had any problems. Uh, nobody has, you know, in, in these 20, 22 years or so, nobody's really complained or pointed against us because of that pattern. Uh, it has worked fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay. We will pause here. Now we'll definitely pick up on this next week and talk more about it. As you think about, you know, how that work is going to, how the work you're pioneering is going to grow over time, and what are the things we need to keep in mind uh, as we do that, right? So, may I request somebody just to uh, please pray with us as a class and dismiss us? Thank you. Anybody could pray. I pray that um thank you so much God for bless Ashes Lord that you bless him for the remaining group.
Amen. Okay, we we didn't hear you actually, but amen. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll meet again soon, and uh, God bless. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. See you again. God bless.